David Morris and his team prepare to move in on the man they believe is responsible for three murders, Peter Moore. They don't know how the man in black, clearly capable of extreme violence, will react to his capture. Myself and a colleague, we followed him along the road and, and when he stopped um, to pick up a, a, another person, that's when my, my colleague and I stepped forward and arrested Peter in his vehicle. At the time I was struck by how calm he took the whole situation. For Peter Moore, the movie buff and the showman, his moment in the spotlight has arrived. He tells police everything he has done in intricate detail. He freely reveals the truth about another murder, one police did not know about. We weren't aware that Edward's body was in Kilcainog Forest. It was only because Peter Moore admitted to us what he'd done and described the location that we were able to locate Edward's body. In the interview room with David Morris, Peter Moore continues to let him know of everything. He tells police about dozens of other attacks. If the story is to be told, Moore wants it all to be revealed. He is the star of this movie. Peter Moore likes the sense of acting out the role of the serial killer, of the person who has terrorized a neighborhood, who has done things that no one else would ever dream of having done themselves. He seemed to take some pride, really, in what he was doing and what he'd done. I remember on one occasion I asked him how he felt about one of the murders, and he said to me, I was, I was pleased, it was a job well done. Just as he enjoyed reading the newspapers at the time of committing the murders, Peter Moore wants to enjoy poring over the details of his trial. He seemed to revel in the publicity. While he was on remand, he wrote to me offering uh, details about his background and photographs of himself and so on, uh, just to ensure that accurate reports uh, appeared in the press. I've covered a few fairly high-profile cases in the past, but nothing to compare with this. Such dramatic developments every day, virtually, and, and some of them took everybody by surprise. As police continue to question Peter Moore, word eventually gets to friends that he is the man who has murdered so many in North Wales. It didn't mean anything at all. I just thought, well, I didn't understand, believe it, that he would have done it. But there again, when you... They put it all together, there was no question that he did, and that's what he was like. So he wasn't what he, he wasn't quite what he sold. He wasn't the person that everybody thought he was. It was something quite different. Local reporters who had been happy to publicize Peter's good works with cinemas were now preparing to report on Peter Moore, the perverted killer. I didn't know him that well, but he struck me as a pretty genial, helpful guy. There was nothing I can think of in his behavior, uh, in what he said, how he behaved, that suggested that he was a dangerous serial killer. Perhaps not the most likable of characters, but he should have such a dark side to him. And it wasn't just the murders, but it was all the other background that came out. He seemed quite open about it. That, that's, that was so horrible, and he just, he seemed to be uh, boasting uh, about these, uh, these attacks. Just as detectives believe that the case is clear-cut and will soon end in Moore's imprisonment, the film aficionado changes tack. From nowhere, he introduces the fact that he had an accomplice, one who shared the name of a notorious movie character. He changed his stance, if you like, and, and introduced the, the Jason character. Peter was Adam and Jason was a friend of his who he nicknamed Jason because of his, his fondness for knives like the character Jason from the Friday the 13th series of films. But we were in no doubt that, that Peter was in fact Jason. Jason and Peter were one and the same. There was no other accomplice. This is merely more trying to deflect, more trying to suggest shadows when in fact uh, the case is really quite black and white. He said it was Jason, which was from the Friday the 13th film. <laughs> but you didn't believe that, you can believe anything. When the case comes to court, police reveal other of Moore's characteristics. Darlington House, the prestigious family home, offers up some contradictory finds. The police showed film of the date taken of his living premises, uh, living quarters in Darlington House. 
and it was most odd because he had chintz curtains and uh, fluffy toys on his bed and yet he still had a dagger and a truncheon and uh, a Nazi helmet and a uh, police helmet and so on. Peter the sadistic showman continues to play to the crowd even at the trial. On one occasion when he was being taken from court to the prison van um, and whereas most uh, people, most defendants ask for a blanket to be put over, over their heads and so on. He refused the offer of a blanket and looked and half smiled towards the cameramen, um, uh, almost to make sure that uh, they got decent pictures of him. He holds up his hands, his handcuffed hands, as if he's celebrating, as if he's some kind of triumphant athlete entering the court, as opposed to somebody who's been um, charged with four murders. Peter Moore was found guilty on all counts of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. But from prison, he decides to appeal, and it's now that he writes to reporter Gareth Hughes, seeking publicity for his new campaign. I was inundated with letters from him from prison relating to his appeal, and also uh, he spoke of various other civil actions that he was taking. Um, he took civil action against North Wales Police. Peter Moore's letters to Gareth Hughes are intended to convince the world of his innocence, but they show something else, Peter's ability to keep secrets. There's no signs in the writing that he has any feeling towards other people. There are no curves. At the end of a, a word, often, there's a little curve, but not in any of his writing. It's all quite abrupt, it's all quite hard. Um, there's no sign that, that he cares whether people like what he said or not. But he knows that he, he has to survive in a social setting or, a, or an interactive setting by at least putting on an act. The Man in Black has continued to seek a starring role in the lives of those living in North Wales. On the 3rd of March 2011, Moore challenged his imprisonment in the European Court of Human Rights with a view to having the time he must spend in prison reduced. It was a bold move, which on the 17th of January 2012, failed. His judges have decreed that he will spend the rest of his life behind bars. For those who knew him, the man in black had acted out two fantasies. One, in which he was a friendly local cinema manager, and the other, as a frenzied killer. Local people felt, once the trial was over, they wanted to forget about it. Um, and yet, they couldn't, because it's been such a horrific uh, series of events. When it did come out, I was so shocked that it was um, the bloke that we'd, you know, known for most of my life and the fact that he was renting our cinema. The chap's facade was perfect. He just looked like a gentleman. We, we thought he was a very nice chap and uh, we had no qualms about leaving our children with him. Yes, he was eccentric possibly, but Never in my wildest dreams did I suspect that I was in the presence of a serial killer. He must have been a complete sadist. He just enjoyed inflicting pain on people. Which is... it's, it's not the guy we saw here, though. It's, it's very, very strange. But luckily uh, for everybody, he's, uh, he's locked up in prison, and that's where he'll stay. He's going to rot in prison until his dying day, and uh, hurrah for that.